Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and uh, wow, I'm excited to be back from the first annual, probably, International Flat Earth Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. That was a really amazing event, and I decided to bring the person who's responsible for me being there in the first place, Mark Sargent. Mark Sargent, are you there? I am here, Rob. Thank you very much for that. And by the way, thank you for throwing me under the bus with that custom (laughs) slide that I did not see until later. I had actually left the room for an interview and I heard it's like, oh, by the way, did you know that you ruined Rob Skiba's life? And then everyone was coming up to me literally during the course of the event and said, "Uh, yeah, it's your fault. That was like (laughs) the running theme. So thank you for that. Yeah, that was the second slide in my presentation. I said, I've titled this presentation April 15th, 2015, and I hit the next button. The day Mark Sargent ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm, only, I'm only halfway kidding about that. I know. I know you are. <laughs> and, then, and then John from security, he finally admitted to me that he was the guy, well, at least he's taking credit for it, that, uh, that got you to listen to the Canary Cry uh, remind you about the Canary Cry interview two years ago. Uh, John Gabrielson. Yeah, yeah. He, he had actually, yeah, to be fair, he's the one that started it. He, he's the one that put the little seed in my head, but <laughs> yeah, he, he came up, uh, cause I've done conferences. He, he hosts me and several other people, um, once a year down in Austin, Texas. And, uh, he came up to Dallas one weekend and he had his kids with him and we went out to eat and we're sitting there just having a good time. And he says, Hey, um, you ever wonder how water bends? And I said, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> you know, he said, well, you know, how does water bend? I'm like, water seeks level. It doesn't bend. What do you, you know, he said, well, yeah, water is level, but how, how does the Pacific ocean for existence, for, for example, uh, curve eight inches per mile squared. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, he's, trying, he's, just, <laughs> he's really, you know, tweaking me, you know, yeah. and, uh, uh, he got me thinking, of course, my answer, like everybody else was, gravity right yeah exactly um he says eh, i don't think you know he's the one to put the sort of the seed in my head you might want to look into this a little bit and nice. of course i had seen lots of stuff being passed around social media at that time and i just deleted it blocked it paid no attention to it this is ridiculous but um when i was looking for something to listen to on my way to do my taxes my accountant is an hour and a half away i Looked around for some podcasts. I, you know, several places I typically go to, and one of them was Canary Cry. And I happened to see the show that they did with you. And I thought, you know, because it was in April. Yeah. And so I thought, you know, maybe this is an April Fool's joke. You know, these guys are kind of goofy, crazy guys. So I thought, you know, you know, uh, this should be a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and well, as they say, the rest is history. But yeah. s- speaking of history, yeah, I thought, I thought what I'd like to do is maybe go back in time a little bit and work our way forward up to, you know, this, this conference. Sure. Um, you know, we don't have to go all the way back, but I know you weren't the first to, um, you know, break flat earth on the scene on no. the internet. I know there are others yeah. before you, but, um, you know, tell us, a, you've been on the show before, but just by way of refresher, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit more about your background again and how did you first get introduced to the subject flat earth and what led you to doing flat earth clues in 2015? Sure. I, I mean, I was a conspiracy guy for years and years going all the way back to Oliver Stone's JFK in the early nineties. I saw it in the theater opening weekend. And up until that point, Literally, I didn't even know that conspiracies existed. I, I literally did not. I grew up in a rural island up northwest of Seattle, so I was super naive and sheltered. Didn't think that people lied in any position of power. I, I just There's an old saying now that I adhere to, which is trust everyone, but ch- but count your change. <laughs> I, I did not adhere to that at all. I never counted my change figuratively, literally. I was like, yeah, everything's great. Uh, and then I was in conspiracies for, you know, once that started and of course the internet was ramping up shortly after that, uh, I was, I digested everything I could to the point where 20 years later, when I was out in Colorado, I had moved from Seattle out to Boulder, Colorado to play video games for a living. 
And I <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> play video games for the, now. Are you serious about that? Or are you, you, oh, I'm, abs- no, I'm absolutely serious. That, I, that is no figure of speech. People say, no, you didn't really, you, you just got drunk and played video games. No, no, I, I won a computer pinball tournament when I was in Seattle for, uh, the developer was out of Tokyo and the publisher, the producers were out of Boulder, Colorado, out of what was, which was really strange because most of your video game companies are in, in California, but this was a California transplant. He grew up in Colorado and he wanted to always move back. So he said, oh, I'm going to start up a little company out there. So anyway, I win this tournament. Uh, it was computer pinball simulation. Uh, it, it took a year to play. Uh, I, I did bend the rules a little bit, but w- if you want me to tell, talk about that, we can talk about it later. And w- after I won, part of my prize was to beta test one of their new games. They said, oh, yeah, you know, and, and I wrote a scathing review. I hated it. I, 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 I was that was like my, my first delving into testing. And I wrote them and they forwarded it off to the guy in Tokyo. who They, they came over for the E3 show and they said, you know what, maybe you should hire this guy. And I flew out to Boulder, Colorado in a snowstorm, thought I'd landed in the wrong airport. I honestly, if you've ever been to Colorado, I thought I landed in like Anchorage, Alaska. I'd never seen snow like that (laughs) Uh, because up in the Northwest, you just don't get it. And they hired me on the spot and they said, go back and get your stuff and, and come out to Colorado. And I spent the next three years being a ringer. A four video game company. I mean, nobody else in the company, you know, they were marketers and, and different developers and people that specialized in box design and crap like that. Nobody actually played the games. So I went to the, you know, I went to Macworld San Francisco and Macworld Boston and E3 and anything else we get our hands on. And I would literally just stand there all day, you know, arcade style from the 80s and play games. And and I would hire developers. I, officially, my title was producer because I would call. I would look at other games, shareware games, back when the, those guys were still around, and hire these people. You know, I'd, I'd interview sound guys and graphics guys and programmers and the whole nine yards. We put games together, and that's what I did. And it was a blast. I loved it. I I, I, I was I had so much fun doing it because I was in the industry. And this was in the mid '90s when everything was new and totally wide open, you know. And we held on for as long as we could, and uh, then we, they finally folded. And then I ended up teaching propri- I, I just jumped over to non-entertainment software companies and taught proprietary software for the better part of 20 years out in Colorado. So, sorry. So, that's so you were in the in the gaming. Uh, world back right. in in the northwest and that whole area over there have you ever heard of you know some say it's urban legend i, mm-hmm. I i'm not sure if it is or not um well, it's a, one of these very interesting topics if you ever looked into it called polybius have you ever heard of polybius polybius no i think I... was in oregon if i remember i think. no 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 why what was it well, it's been a long time. I actually wrote a movie script about it. Uh, that's kind of a spinoff on it in 2009, but yeah. called The Protean Field. But uh, Polybius, and it's been, again, it's been a while since I've looked into it, so I may not get all the parts of the story right, but you can just look it up. Um, was allegedly, you know, this is back in the early 80s. Sure. So like 81 yeah, or some. So, yeah, yeah, back yeah. in the day, pre, pre-Microsoft sort of. Yeah, these yeah. these are the the stand up video games, you know, the yeah. Pac Man, you know, that whole era. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. but but supposedly, uh, you know, kids would play this game, and they'd end up having like uh, seizures and stuff when they played oh. the game, and so you know people weren't sure what was going on with that, and uh, according to the stories, yeah, people who owned arcade. Uh, uh, arcades in that area where that game was, yeah. you know, usually the the game owners or the you know the people who who they licensed the machine from or whatever would come in and they would count receipts and you know money and whatnot. But supposedly, whenever the people came for this machine, they would plug something into the back of it, re- download some da- data from it or whatever, and just kind of leave the scene and you know nobody knew what was up. And then oh. all of a sudden, the the machines just you know after. Of a while, they just disappeared. No one saw them again. Um, wow! So people are the 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 urban legend side of it is that this may have been some sort of you know branch of MK Ultra, seeing what you know video games could do to kids and whatnot. But it wouldn't. Yeah, yeah that wouldn't surprise me at all. And I know I was deep into the arcade games back in the day. Uh, I knew just about everything about everything. And if that story is true, it absolutely wouldn't surprise me because of the early. Super Nintendo machines that came out 
there was a um, the, you know there was a warning on the side uh, you know about a frame rate issue that could potentially cause in certain situations uh, seizures. And this was pre HD television, and they, I don't know how exactly they fixed it, but I remember that very very clearly. And that was on a you know a console game on a television. So yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. I yeah, I just looked it up while you were talking. I, I, there's a, actually a Wikipedia entry on this thing. Uh, Polybius P O L Y B I U S Urban Legend, wow. and, and it talks about how uh, in pop culture it's actually made its appearance in some things like uh, episodes of, uh, of The Simpsons, yeah. sort of in the in the background. <laughs> right. Uh, and according to the story too, it, there was a, a plaque or something, you know, somewhere on it. Usually, you know, it'd say the maker of the the game or whatever, but this said the property of the U.S. government. Oh wow, yeah, that would that would be something. It wouldn't, you know, they would have to have a really limited market. So when you mentioned Oregon, yeah, sure, why not? I played a lot of different arcades in the Seattle area. And, uh, we, yeah, you want an isolated market and then, you know, monitor it. And, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. I'm not going to uh, throw that story out. No. <laughs> apparently it was in, I uh, just looked at, it says, the story tells of an unheard of new arcade game appearing in several suburbs of Portland, Oregon in 1981. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's something you might want to check. Uh, <laughs> I will look into that. That's really, really good. Uh, uh, the, old, the, the, close, the, the coolest little story I had... Um, other than a programmer, the uh, developer that worked for our team. Oh, okay, two quick stories on the video game side. There's a developer that worked for our team, and he was older. He was like in his early 40s, and that was unusual because it was the mid-90s. Because you, you, know, you backdate the years. It's like, dude, uh, you've been programming since the early 80s. How are you even here right now? How are you working for a small development company? He goes, well, let me tell you. He goes, I'm, work I'm working in with my roommate in this in this stupid apartment, and uh, this company caught, gets a hold of us and says, yeah, we're trying to develop this brand new thing. It's a combination spreadsheet and graphics program and word processing program. And it was handed to him, you know, the assignment folder. And he goes, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And so I just dumped it to my roommate and go, here, it's a piece of crap. You take it. You know what that project was? <laughs> mm. Microsoft Works 1.0. Nice. <laughs> and, and I go, oh, no. And he goes, yeah. And I go, what happened to your roommate? And he goes, man. I don't even know. Last time I heard, he bought an island somewhere, and he was never heard <laughs> from again. Um, the other one was back in the day when I was playing. Uh, we uh, we were talking with a company way back in you know the day uh, um, early um, early guys that were working on programming stuff, and I won't I won't name them right away, but. They were based out of Chicago, and they they made a little game called Marathon, like a first person shooter. And you know, we were talking after work once, and we were talking about a project they were never going to finish. And, and it's like, yeah, we're never going to finish this old project. And that project ended up being Halo. <laughs> oh wow! I know. And Microsoft, and they wouldn't have finished it, but Microsoft was scouring the, the country, and they went to them in Chicago and said, "Hey, do you got anything you'd finish?" And they said, "Well, what if you gave you a whole bunch of money?" Uh, by the way, you got to move to Seattle. To, to finish it. And they said, sure, why not? You know, the rest, as they say, was history. So. so are you an actual game programmer yourself? Or I have dabbled. I have dabbled in development. But no, I, it, for me, it takes the mystery out of it. That's uh. the one thing I hated about developers is when I watch them you know, intensely. I mean, you remember, you're programming every nuance of every little thing that seems magical to you in the game, everything that gives you, you know, the, 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 good, the feel goods. Yeah. And so the programmers that I knew, they, they of course they didn't play their own game. Of course they they tested them, but they didn't yeah. get any joy out of it because yeah, they, they know they, how it works. Yeah, it was it. Uh, the whole um, you know, I hate to use the the comparison, but uh, God doesn't play dice because God wrote dice. So God can't <laughs> play dice. So he he probably would like to, but he can't. And so yeah, that's so. But I did. Yeah, I dabbled a little bit, but not enough to where I I knew it's like no 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 I can't I can't because I I loved playing so much anyway so that's that's what i did out in colorado did a whole bunch of conspiracies and then let's let's fast forward to where uh i i done so I've, i looked into so many conspiracies and you know if you're if you're familiar when youtube first came out you know things gradually ramped up a lot you know the rabbit holes started appearing to yeah. where it's like by the time i got to like 2012 2013 and, you know, nothing happened in 2012. You know, Nibiru didn't show up and nothing. Right. You know, I watched the movie. You know, the 2012 movie count in 2009. So it's like, okay, I pretty much I pretty much thought that YouTube or all conspiracies had jumped the shark. 
So that's when I was just kind of dabbling in little little nooks and crannies that maybe I hadn't looked at. And that's when I made the mistake of clicking on the very first video that had Flat Earth in it. And it was in the middle of 2014. Mm-hmm. To w- and I, I just clicked on it just because it's like, you know what? Why not? I hate it. it everyone knows it's stupid. It's ridiculous. There's, there's nothing to it. I'm just going to click on it so I can – it's on my bucket list, right? It's like well, I, I didn't have a bucket list. I just made up one. It's like, okay, I'm going to click on it. And the first, first thing that got me was I had a visceral response to clicking on it. And I have never felt that ever in my life about anything. And look, you know, like I'm a, I'm a gamer. I'm a tech guy. I've gone to some pretty weird places in the internet, you know, places that would you know, make a lot of people blush. I have never gotten embarrassed about going anywhere. When it comes to the internet and for whatever reason I did when I clicked on that video, I mean, I literally got flushed and I caught myself doing it. I mean, literally like a, like a little mini sense of panic. Like, why are you clicking on this? And I was going, whoa, 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 what's this? What's, what's happening here? And I watched the video and it was about flight routes in the Southern hemisphere by a guy in, out in Germany. It was in German, but I got, I got the gist of it. And at the very end, he was kind of hinting, you know, not that he was completely sold on flat earth, but he was going that, um, that that it only works on a flat earth. That the flights only make sense on a flat earth. I was going, oh, okay, that's that's pretty good. And then I, of course, made the mistake of clicking on uh, Matt Boylan's video, which I'm sure you watched, mm-hmm. where he's sitting on the couch, sober, mind you. And he, he, just, he just look, it's a rare occurrence. He's sitting on the couch sober and his inter- and his girlfriend, his Canadian girlfriend at the time, was interviewing him. And was asking him all these questions. He's describing this this NASA function that he went to. Now, whether or not you believe he worked for NASA, it's a whole other thing. I do believe he went to this NASA function in the United, eastern United States back in the uh, the early 2000s. And he was talking about this story where you know it was down to candlelights and wine, and he it, you know the high level. It was a spooky story. How they were you know one of the friends was saying, well. You know, I heard a rumor, Paul, that uh, GPS doesn't work in, in down in Antarctica. And like, well, Jim, you should send a, one of your teams out there to confirm that. And then some, cre- you know, some high-ranking creepy guy shows up and goes, well, if he sends out his teams that far, they're not coming back. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, so what is you know, the, the obvious question? Like, why aren't they coming back? Right? And it's like, oh, well, because GPS doesn't work down there. And it's like, okay, why? Because too cold? He goes, no, because it's flat. And, and and it's like you know the, it's like nobody well a few of the people got it other people didn't get it and then the man proceeds to take a piece of chalk apparently it was his house and starts drawing on the floor the the map of of what the world looked like and he's talking while he's doing it going into thermodynamics and energy and how the system works in a in a circular pattern not a global you know like I've I've seen your map projections when you take the weather and you you project it onto the the azimuthal map and it looks so much more efficient right it just goes in a circle and he goes he goes all has to do with temperature and energy and and how the whole thing that's how the whole thing is you know is powered and when he was done drawing all this stuff out you know you pull back you can imagine the wide shot he's pulling back and you're looking at the UN flag and that story got me intrigued enough to where, because I, you know, I, I, I was envisioning it as a movie, you know, like a, like a short, short movie intro. I was going, oh, you know what? I, I, with whether or not I believe it or not, I like that story. So I'm going to try to disprove flat Earth, like we all do, right? It's like I'm going to shut this thing down on a weekend, get done with it. But I, I did enjoy that story. It was the story that kind of prompted me to, to, to move forward. And because there was not much content back then. I had to rely. I mean, I literally joined one of the flat Earth societies, the one that uh, Eric Dubay pulled out of and pretty much collapsed it for at least a year and a half. And and there was there was just wasn't a lot of roads to turn. I was I was I mean, I literally was was scrambling for any information I I could get, like a lot of us when we were starting, and hammered on it and hammered on it until that that Jerry Maguire moment when which you've heard me say before you know February 10th uh, 2015 where I literally woke up in the middle of the night and I said you know what I'm not doing this by myself anymore uh, I've got I've got a narrative in my head I ca- I t- cannot prove the globe in a court of law I'm going to put I'm going to make a series of videos I didn't know how many it was even going to be at the time I'm going to put them out on the internet and I'm going to say all right internet hive mind bring it 
you know, what do you got? Bring bring me what you got because I can't I can't do this anymore. And I'll and not, I'll make it easy for you. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Shoot me down. Show me where I went wrong so I can get some sleep, and I'll be done with it. And and that was it. You know. And and I mean I was pretty. And and what was weird was when I woke up in the middle of the night, I had all the words in my head. I had the narrative in my own voice. That's what was creeping me out to where I I've never typed. Uh, written so clearly before where I just, you know, wrote paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, never went back and tore anything down. Uh, you know, a few fine adjustments here and there in verbiage. And that's how, uh, the, the first clue was born where I just woke up. I mean, and I didn't know anything about anything about video editing. I just literally, it's like, I felt like Forrest Gump. You remember he was running across <laughs> the country. He gets to one side. It's like, well, I got to one side. So I might as well just turn back and go back again. That's it. It's like, well, I just typed out the narrative. I might as well, uh, I might as well get my mic up phone on and record it. So that's what I did. And it's like, well, it's now recorded. I might as well get some slides and attach that. It's, it's like, and, and let's, let's put a couple of transitions there, you know, use a windows live movie maker. It was free. And at the end of the day, put out the video and waited for the response. And, oh my, was I not ready for that? Cause I honestly thought, I truly honestly thought that there would be a um, academic, some astrophysicist, some astronomer that would call me up and say, OK, well, you forgot to carry the two or your decimal is in the wrong place or whatever it is. You can just shut this whole thing down now and, and torture your YouTube channel. And instead, the exact opposite happened to where people were calling me quickly. You know, and that was that was when I answered the phone back then. Like, like Rick, <laughs> Rick, Rick makes this thing out of it. It's like I called him and he answered. He talked to me, and I did. Rick, Rick called me back in the day. Well, and I did, I did too. The yeah. Day after I listened to Canary Cry. Do you know the the first person that that literally called me though was I? I, I will say this: he, he may be Captain Jack Sparrow. You know, he's you know unpredictable. <laughs> but it was Matt Boylan. He called really? me, but by, by the time I got to Clue Eight. He called me and he goes, why aren't you returning my texts? Apparently he's been texting me since Clue 2. And I go, because I don't have a cell phone? <laughs> it's, like, it's like your texts aren't going anywhere. I don't know why they aren't bouncing back to you. And, and uh, But yeah, and then people, yeah, it, the weird interviews started happening like immediately. You know, it just started escalating very, very quickly to where, yeah, Canary Cry, I, I, didn't, I hadn't heard of anybody that was that was calling to interview me. And so like when the uh, coast to coast thing happened, that was only in three months. That was one of the most embarrassing phone calls of my life because I had heard of those guys and she was calling me. She was going, OK, uh, what's your book? And I go, oh, I don't have a book. She goes, what's your DVD? I go, I don't have a DVD. She goes, OK, <laughs> what's your website? And I go, look, I've only been doing this for not even three months. And she was getting angry with me. It's like, OK, why am I talking to you? And I go, you called me. I didn't call <laughs> you. What am I supposed to do here? And she's, OK, give me your five minute pitch. Go. And I go, all right. Because she had heard of me through Ground Zero with uh, Clyde Lewis. And, uh, and I gave her my pitch. And she goes, OK, you're on, uh, I, I think, in like five days or something. Like that. Be ready. You know, and, and she gave me the time. And I'm going, really? It's that late? But I didn't complain. I knew it was coast to coast. And that was it. And then after that, uh, I, I immediately started scrambling. It's like, crap, I got to get a website up because if, if this is going to happen, because honestly, I felt bad. I felt like uh, uh, just a, a rookie out there. And then people, yeah, then then we, you and I got in touch or, or fair, around that time. Actually, I think you were I think you were before Coast to Coast because you were in April. Yeah, April. Yeah. So February, March. Yeah. So you were two months in. You were you were one of my uh, early, very early, early guys early guys and and i yeah i remember you, you mentioned the canary cry thing and I, I knew the story and uh it was it was great just listening to you because i know you were struggling with it and then you know i watched you build uh testing the and and going through that trial and tribulation <laughs> and it was and i remember i remember specifically because you know people the community was much much smaller and and people are going there's a phil collins video up there's a Phil Collins video. <laughs> up. What happened? And I go, I don't know. I, I do not know. I have not talked to the man. And it's, yeah, back then it was it was harder. <laughs> it, it was, as you know, it was, yeah. it was way harder. So, you know, anyway. that's that, that's funny because uh, um, when, when I built Testing the Globe initially, it was yeah. on a different one. I, I got several other websites and it was it was just a originally 
a blog post on one of my other websites that I kept adding to. And I want to say in less than a month, probably yeah. more like two or three weeks after our interview, mm-hmm. I had so much content written on that stupid blog that I said, oh, crap, I, I just need to I need to hack this up and turn it into its own website. Yeah. And, you know, split it up in the chapters and stuff like that. And so, yeah, that, you know, by April, maybe May or not too long after that initial blog was written, I started doing videos on it and um, and then got just hammered. <laughs> like, <laughs> holy cow, man. It was like Rambo was around every corner and he was going <laughs> unleashing oh, everything yeah. on me. And so, I, you know, of course, there was a lot of other things going on in my life at the time too, but but it was August. So what, May, June, July, August. So four months into it, I was like, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Screw <laughs> this, man. <laughs> You know, I have and, never, I've never seen a Phil Collins video go up in replacement for, you know, this site is shutting web, down for a whole website. I don't care anymore on every page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, that was about that was, the, I listened to, I don't even know how I stumbled. I mean, of course I'm aware of the song, but something I did led me to that video and I'm listening to it. I'm like, oh my God, these words are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no, you got the point. And yet, a few <laughs> days later, you yeah, uh, three days later. Yeah. yeah, it was it was great. I was so glad you came back too, because everybody needed you. Well, oh, thank you. Did. We're going to break, and uh, we'll come back and talk some more. Okay. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and I'm talking with my guest, Mark Sargent. And uh, right before the break, in the previous segment, we were talking about sort of Mark's journey that led him into Flat Earth. And uh, Mark, you made a statement early on in the first uh, segment where you were talking about, you know, why would people lie, you know? Right, right. And um, I had an interesting conversation with somebody at the conference, and they were kind of struggling with that, too. And... It's because most of us are oh. generally honest people. I mean, we're, oh, yeah. you know, for the most part, most people are, you know, honest people that just want to love and be loved and, you know, mind their own business and whatnot. So because we are not that way, it's yeah. inconceivable to us that there are people out there who could be so dark, so evil, you know, and the the extent that they can do things that we would never imagine right. is, is unthinkable to us yeah yeah and and i've tried to break it down in a whole bunch of different ways when it comes to the line things again i grew up so sheltered that i didn't really think that authorities would lie to me even when i got to college you know it was it was unthinkable because children don't believe in lies and in fact i was thinking of a story just today that that came out uh you know the site rotten tomatoes where they do the movie reviews and the the justice league movie actually this fits in pretty well the justice league movie was coming out this coming up real soon and they were complaining people were complaining because the reviews weren't being posted on rotten tomatoes yet which was kind of odd it would be delayed for some reason you're saying well why would they do that you know it's rotten tomatoes well Time Warner, the people that made the Justice League, also own a minority share in Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> so uh, how uh, it, start, it starts a little small. I mean, we lie. There's so much deception. I mean, let's face it. It's a world of deception yeah. in, in so many little ways. But that's a perfect example. It's like, look, they knew the reviews were going to be bad. They had influence over the reviewing site. And had they let it come out normally, it could have cost them, I don't know, upwards of 
10 million, let's just say $10 million. That's $10 million. It's, that's a short meeting. It's like, all right, call up Rotten Tomatoes, delay this thing as long as you can. And then, of course, Fox News broke the story and they had to release it anyway. But the fact that they even tried was was something. So I, and I don't know if you're talking if you're talking about the, the person you were discussing the lies with. Was that the ABC News lady? Uh, well, she that expressed that too. Uh, if yeah. you saw the interview, she's like, you know, why? You know, that I mean, it's so many. That's one of the questions everybody yeah. asks. Well, why would they lie? Why you know? would they lie? Yeah. And and by the way, congratulations on that. I I really hope they use as much of you as they as they can. Uh, on that, you you were way more composed than I was. Uh, the lighting that they put on me, they just put one of those. You probably had the same that brick LED light. Yeah. But they but they had Boom. me. Yeah, it was horrible, but they were. But I was facing it. She was Full literally on. standing right underneath it. I couldn't even see her. So if she had any little facial expressions, micro expressions, I I could I all I could tell was she was a woman. That yeah. was it. I mean, the rest of it was horrible. So, but and so I was listening to your entire thing, you know, and she was going because that's one. I get that question probably one out of every eight, one out of every ten people. Sure. They'll say, sure. "Well, why would they lie? Why would they cover it up?" I'm going. Are you kidding me? It's the, it's like look, it is the biggest. It's the biggest thing ever. Next to uh, what happens, you know, is there life after death? There, yeah. there is no bigger story. And it's well, it's just the shape of your world. I'm going. No, no, no. It's more than that because the shape also determines really your spirituality. Which is look, you're, if it was built, then it was there was created. If it was created, then you were never alone. Yeah. The the institution of science, and you know, you've heard me. Look, science done some great things for us, of course, but they've turned into their own religion. Yeah. And they've made, and of course, they are going to protect their own, like Time Warner did, like Enron did, like oh, I don't know, just about any corporation. You're going to protect your own institution. So if they got to a point where they realized, after oh, I don't know, twenty twenty five generations, that the world was not a globe, are they going to tell the people no? No, that's a short meeting. <laughs> it's like it's like what what you know they sit around the table and say what could possibly go wrong and then in 10 minutes let's oh I don't know how about academia being turned upside down how about economics you'd have to shut down the the world markets for at least a month or longer just to figure out what the heck you were going to do oh, and oh, I don't know the big one what happens to spirituality of everybody when they figure out they're not alone anymore you know you remember you're not the ultimate power in the world unless you're the ultimate power you can't admit to a higher power. It's it's one of the rules. And yeah, ev evolution's a crock. Oh well, my God! Oh I mean, the oh the questions know. that it opens up. Oh yeah, and you've heard me say it. it's like, well, so you were wrong about that globe thing. What else are you wrong about? Let's talk about evolution, shall we? Let's talk about the Big Bang theory and dark matter and all that other stuff you've just been inventing. Oh oh, the science science would be on its heels. For a long, long time, which is why in the clues, I even I even made a plea to to religion as a whole. I said, look, you're going to be tempted to burn it all down. <laughs> you're going to go to the universities and just start <laughs> ripping up the place. Don't do it. But don't do it. But at the same time, I mean, science has been beating over, you know, beating the heads of, of religion for a long time now. I mean, generation after generation. So. Uh, it's a, it's a tough call, but yeah, yeah. Why? And that's just small thinking. I'm sorry. Let me, let me one more point here. Cause people will say, I've heard this line literally almost verbatim, which is, well, you know, I still gotta go to my stupid job in the morning and my wife hates me and my kids don't listen to me. That's not going to change. I'm going, well, yeah, but it kind of will because everybody else around you, that's all they're going to be talking about. It's kind of like the analogy I came up with recently was it's kind of like being told you're adopted and then you're ignoring it, you're ignoring it, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, maybe I am adopted. The second you start believing it, all of a sudden you start reevaluating -evalu every conversation you've had with your yeah. parents going all the way back. It, it ripples in time, which is why Flat Earth does the same thing. Because literally you're going, you know this. It, you're All of a sudden when you click over, when you start thinking about it, you start thinking about that globe in your, when you were six years old. And it's like, wait a minute. That thing in the classroom, that wasn't real. And then it and, it and it just echoes. It echoes through every year up until where you are now. And it scares people in some yeah. cases. I mean, I mean, yeah, we haven't had people jump off of bridges or blow up a post office or anything. But I mean, most of it's been really, really peaceful. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard tears. I, you know, I've seen people yell. I mean, heck, I'll, let me throw one thing at you real quick. Sorry. Uh, I know I can ramble. 
which is my cousin. Right? I've got a, a, a cousin who's older than me by a couple of years. She, she and I have never had a bad word between us ever in the history of our life. You know, we're, we're both you know, pushing 50 and we've never had a bad word between us. And when she saw that BBC clip that came out recently where I was on it, she went in and she's known I've been in this for a while. She went into a fit of rage and wrote me just a small paragraph used profanity, mm. uh, just came at me. And I'm going, there it is. That's, you know, that's <laughs> what I've is. been. Uh, well, uh, people, you know, I've, I've told people, you know, it's like, you know, they've told me about family members and I didn't quite relate until I saw that. Mm. And I was like, yep, there it is. I, yeah, I was going to ask you, how have, how has your family and close friends and associates uh, responded to you? Half and half. So, and which is what I expect. I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a fairly eccentric guy anyway. I mean, you know. I, <laughs> so they're like, oh, I, there I, he goes I, again. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thrown out of college for manufacturing explosives on campus. Oh, I man. won a video game tournament and played video games for a living. Uh, I didn't, <laughs> I've done some weird things, right? But so there were some people who's like, well, if anyone is going to get into this, it's Mark. But at the same time, uh, it still comes down to a belief system. So if you can get, uh, you know, aside from that initial knee-jerk reaction of, well, that guy's an idiot, you can get past that, then it's a question of how, how much you're willing to look. I actually like your thing where it's like, you know, spend 24 hours and, and you know, divvy it up any way you want, but, but look at it that long because it does take a little bit of time yeah. to, to dig into it. Um, my sister, for example, uh, believes in the media, period. So it goes from God's lips to Fox News. If it's not on <laughs> Fox News, it didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, but I've had other cousins that are on board, but but it's all they, everyone's got their own little caveat. So I've got one cousin in Arizona who I know believes in it. He, in fact, he might have been listening to the show, and he, his wife does not. So he's in the you know he's in that closet category where he really can't talk about it. Same thing with my one of my other cousins uh, up from my dad's side. Uh, he's totally into it. He sent me an email. I've kept it just in case. Aaron, in case you're listening, I've kept that email. It's like, right on, man. But, you know, he's still not going to come to the meetups with me, even though we're, we're close. <laughs> um, my mom is one of those mothers that, unfortunately, she'd back me even if I was probably killing people, <laughs> to be honest. You know, it's like you hear the serial killers, you know, it's the mother knew the entire time. That's probably my mother. Um, my father, on the other hand, he's more skeptical. So, yeah, it's, it really goes back and forth. But everybody's got their own um, – Little, it's usually somebody else that's stopping them from being enthusiastic about it because they're worried about you know their job, their marriage, the, you know their friends. You know, I mean, no one wants to be that guy that that comes. You know, no one wants to be the first person on the dance floor and look stupid. And I feel you know in the early day, you know, in the early days, all of two years ago, back <laughs> then, way back, uh, it was back in it the was, day. Back in the day, you remember that 2015. Back in the day, it was it was much harder because again, you know, who who do we have? Tila Tequila. That's all we had. Um, and then and then in 20, it, but it got easier as more as more celebs came out and as more articles got written on it. Um, I you remember the Kent Hovind article where he got out of jail, sorry, yeah. prison, and uh, Forbes magazine ran that article on him because he didn't even know what the heck was happening with Flat Earth out there. And he had to respond to it. And, he, you know, he had to go against it, I think, because, like, it was too early. 2015, he couldn't do it. Now, I think he could. And uh, anyway, so it, it got easier as it went along. So I've gotten to talk to more and more people about it to where this last – and the BBC thing that came out, that was just a fluff piece. And it was like, hey, yeah. wait for HBO or wait till somebody really tries to tear into us. Uh, that came out and my sister actually posted it on Facebook and she, I'm not saying she's completely softening up, but now, but again, because she believes in media, <laughs> she, it's now yeah. more credible because they're talking about, it. it's like, really? So I, you know, that she, it, so it's helping us in some regards, but it's, it's helped me. And honestly, I did, let me end with this. I did 14 interviews in two days. At that freaking conference to where wow. my voice was. But yeah, I, I, and I literally lost track and I was giving out flash flash drive press kits to any yeah, anyone that interviewed me. It's like, look, don't just, you know, you know, don't take my word for it. Start here. Go, you know, I give him a hard copy of the clues. And it's like, here, go run with it, you know, because there's no way I'm going to convince you. But there was so much media there that, you know, any publicity is good publicity. They are going to it's going to be an interesting next couple of weeks. 
for I sure. Just, yeah, I was wondering out. if you if you had uh, something like a thumb drive or a DVD or something with flat Earth clues on it that you can yeah. hand out. Yeah. Because uh, she said uh, the 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 woman that interviewed me and I guess everybody else for Nightline yeah. said that she had seen all the clues. So. Yeah, yeah, I was surprised. Well, I think they kind of told her. They, well, well, who knows? No, no. You know why she walks to the clues? Oh, I can tell you why. Because I had been working one of her. The, this will kind of tell you where we were at the conference. You know, we were. There were more and more media showing up as the. You know, as the hours progressed. Because the, oh, it was the, crazy at one point. Yeah. Yeah, the scuttlebutt was getting out there. It was like, okay, there's something happening. You don't want to get on this, you know, like a like a stock stock market frenzy type yeah. thing. And there was one of their guys. They only sent one guy initially. His name was uh, Darrell, black guy. Yes, yeah, yeah. And he was there the first day, and he realized after he was there that holy smokes, this thing's serious. And I gave him my flash drive. Okay. And he actually downloaded it to his laptop that night. And then by, oh, what was it, 9 or 10 o'clock the, the next morning, she, she came there. in. Yeah, she yeah. was there with, with the support team. And I think he told her, it's like, look, just because I, I, I cheat a little bit. In, in the flash drive, I said, start here. It was flat earth clues. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, with a, just a, a hard, you know, a hard drive copy that you can take. Yeah. And so, yeah, she watched it. But at the same time, but a lot of the others hadn't, uh, which was fine. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. She was yeah. luckily she had done her homework. But. Just to rattle off, I mean, I don't know if you kept track of all the people who were out there, but um, other than ABC Nightline, um, HBO Vice, two a German television, two French, I'm sorry, two British newspapers, a French newspaper, an Australian newspaper, uh, NSTV, BuzzFeed. Oh, they're going to massacre us, by the way. If you want to watch, yeah. you wait. You want the only hit piece, guaranteed hit piece, will be Buzz Television, because yeah. he, I don't know if you talked to that guy, but he was no. like. Uh, Oh God! Thank God, he he wanted to turn it into. He said he wanted to say how, he, the story was going to be along the lines of how the internet is so persuasive that it can create things like religious cults, and yeah. he was a kind of equating this to that. And I was like, all right, I I know where you're going with this, but it's I don't think it's going to get any traction. Uh, but there and then little doc, and then there was the LA documentary team who was there, and all smaller other documentary teams, Howard Stern's team. If they were there, I'm a little worried about those guys. They never checked in. So huh. if they were there, they could have done, you know, a little cloak and dagger and and just kind of walked around. But if they were – but they confirmed like two days before. So we don't know for, for sure if they were there. I'm hoping they weren't because if they were, you know, they you know how they were going to treat it. They yeah. were just going to walk around and take a picture of whoever looks weird. So. Yeah, I saw that ABC guy. Uh, you know, he was at the billboard. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. <clears throat> which that was really day. cool. Yeah. yeah that, that was cool. And, you know, I know Robbie was talking to him. I saw Rick Hummer talking to him. Yeah. Uh, he, he talked to my wife and she got his card and it's like, you know, you really got to talk to him. And so, yeah, so you're the one that gave him the, the flash the, drive. The flash she drive. said, she said in the interview with me, I just got to sign this yesterday. Yeah. So, I, I saw, I, I, I heard her say that and I was going, okay, so she must've been doing like a crash course on the plane Probably. And yeah, just doing whatever she can to get down there. And to be fair, I mean, she was science oriented. And of course, she's mainstream media. She you know, and I'm so careful when I'm talking to anybody now. You know, I treat everything like it's recorded and I really don't try to bring in other conspiracies into it. Right. I don't I don't volunteer them because and I've told Jared this. I go, Jared, do yourself a favor. Don't bring up other conspiracies. I know you want to. I know yeah. you want to. Just don't say it. Don't just say, oh, yeah, just like Sandy Hook. Don't do right. if, you, if you do that, you're, you know, they just latch onto it. Their <clears throat> eyes will absolutely go into a different gear and they'll say, <laughs> okay, so you're one of those guys, right? right? And I remember talking to her when I was, again, standing because I didn't have a chair like some privileged people. <laughs> and she said, and I was talking about how the Soviet Union and the Americans were down on the ice in the same time in Antarctica, you know, and they were they were probably in and out together. And then I just had to throw it in for the heck of it. I go, look, Russia's never been our enemy. We've been, you know, they've been with us at the highest levels the entire time. And of course, right then and there, because you know, Wee? Russia's yeah, <laughs> Russia's a hot, but it's like, wait a minute, you're saying that Russia isn't our enemy? And I stood by it. I said, I go, come on. 
I go, there's a reason why they called it a cold war. We've never gotten into a scrape with these guys. It's the two biggest kids in the block and we've never taken a punch at each other. Come on. Uh, you know, don't it's a, and it's a great hype. And that is, you know, the space race, you know, yeah, it was a race, but we weren't like sabotaging each other's space programs. And so anyway, she latched onto that for a little bit. I'm hoping she isn't used that sound bite for who knows. And, oh, yeah, yeah. By the way, I, got, I appreciate this that you said at the very end. You had that cynical thing kick in where you, you were basically, you know, she is mainstream. I mean, she's about as mainstream media as you get. And you said, yeah, well, you know, you're probably going to just chop this thing up and <laughs> use whatever you want. And you were dead right. I mean, it comes in. She could say, oh, yeah, we'll be objective. But once she said, oh, yeah, there's like 10, 15 people involved. It's like, oh, no, they're going to go for, you know, whatever kind of raises their eyebrow. Oh, and for sure. logical. And they probably interviewed several of us. So. Yeah, You know, I might get a five minute clip. You might get a five minute clip. Everybody's going to get a hodgepodge and, you know, it's yeah. going to be whatever that. But I told him, I said, look, I, you know, I'm happy to do an interview, but I'm going to videotape you interviewing me. <laughs> yeah, no, and you did a great job, and I'm I'm glad. In fact, I just I forwarded once I watched it, I shot it over to some of the uh, the circles and they were, you know, they were like, oh, right on. I mean, no, it, that was more valuable than her interview because you don't know what was lost. Yeah, they're going to take a little it. piece, and I, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with it because whatever they do with it, I'm going to, you know, take yeah. what I have and say, okay, here's the bigger here's, picture of that not sound bite. Yeah, yeah, no, you you were absolutely right to do so. It was perfect, and honestly, if I had, uh, had you know, the wherewithal, I would have probably done the same thing. It didn't occur to me though. I, I, in fact, it didn't occur to me until the BBC fluff piece just came out, because yeah. I talked to that girl. She was like a one man show. And I talked to her literally for 20 minutes straight, you know, with with cool little graphic, you know, the uh, little models and all this other fun stuff. I was I was you know just hitting all these points. And what did she pick up on? She picked up on my negative reinforce. I'm sorry, my reverse psychology thing where I said the kind of a version of yours, which is, you know, don't take my word for it. Yeah, you're like, I could be I could have just I could be a mental patient. (laughs) (laughs) But no, but most people will know anybody, anybody worth their salt is going to know that anybody (laughs) says that it's like I could be a mental patient means you're not a mental patient (laughs) if if you're smart. But I get it. You know, she used that. She also used, you know, the guy with the van or the, you know, the rainbow truck and the parking lots and And the goofy music to set the whole thing up. Like, you know, it's it's like the do 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 kind of music. Like, you know, here's a bunch of idiots. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff you'd hear at a carnival. Type, yeah. of, type of thing. It, might, it wasn't clown car music, but it was pretty damn pretty close. close. <laughs> yeah. Pretty close. Yeah, but I will. I will say this. You know, everything for a reason. When that thing, that little piece came out in London, you know, because it was, it was initially a London company, every BBC thing tied to that seemed to latch on to it. So I immediately got called by a BBC radio company. Uh-huh. That wanted me to do a promo piece, and of course they called me at freaking five a.m. So I, I, by the time I called them back, they were uh, they said, "No, we filled the main spot, but can you do the the six minute promo? You know, the lead in." I go, "Yeah, yeah, let's do it." And but and that one was picked up by another one, and other people looked at that one, and so there's secondary ripples just because of the fluff piece. Because yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of times it's just the headline. You know, it's it's interesting. So yeah, it, at least I will say this: it was a fluff piece, but at the same time, at least they didn't bring in scientist rebuttals and i don't know we'll have to see how some of the others work but i don't think they will i think everyone's going to treat it the same way which is who are the people of flat earth yeah nightline it may I'd, I'd be curious to see because she said something to the effect of you know i think it's a misconception everybody has you know what we try to do is interview people like you okay what do you really believe and if we feel it's necessary we'll get an expert in to you know refute whatever you said or whatever right 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 so th- that will be interesting because i did see i don't know if it was a bbc one or Austra- i think it was australia mm-hmm. where they had some kind of piece it's very similar to that and they had some phd guy saying oh i mean you don't need to be in the space program to know right. the i mean time zones for crying out loud or you know yeah i know he, yep the, that was the arguments that he gave were so lame and i'm like uh, okay yeah that was been- a um, that was a pre conference one i remember that one what you're talking yeah. about yeah that was pre conference <laughs> and you're right yeah whenever which is by the way that's an excellent point you made there the reason why Bill Nye gets drug into so many of these things is because when you grab a real actual bona fide PhD or master's degree in whatever physical science, they're just so dry. You know, these guys were not meant to talk to cameras at all. <laughs> and so when you, you know, so their, their arguments are at the, yeah, they, they come off as arrogant and well, insolent. It's like, wow, well, outrage and science and gravity, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> but, but Bill Nye, 
when you bring him on, he kind of triggers people's subconscious because of that whole stupid science guy thing. I mean, it was only a five year stint at Disney for God's sakes. And he, he's got a bachelor's degree in, in mechanical engineering, but because he looks exactly, I mean, exactly what a nerd should look like, right? <laughs> Tall, thin, angular <clears throat> features, uh, you know, what put on a lab coat and a bow tie, he gets drug into things and people are, I swear to God, if I ever get a, to argue against him, people say, well, do you have a master's degree in something? I go, no, but I don't get invited on consulting things for the Mars Rover. I don't get put on national television to be asked about climate change. Right. And I don't get to be put on a panel next to Neil deGrasse Tyson to talk about quantum physics. Why does he? Because, because he looks like he's smart. That's it. The media is so lazy in those regards. Just yeah. kills me. Just kills me. It's like, how, how can you put him on a panel to, on the Mars rover and take him seriously when he's on Dancing with the Stars? It's just, it's just, I, oh, <clears throat> or just Bill lazy. Nye Saves the World. And Have you watched that show? Oh, you, well, you probably watched as much as I did where the first couple episodes, what was You're that like, about? What? I, mean, I don't think, I honestly, I felt bad for him in that case because like they weren't <laughs> obviously showing like your mu next musical act is going to offend a whole bunch of people. You know, but introduce them anyway, because I he didn't obviously didn't get it. Uh, for him now. Honestly, he's just going in it for a paycheck. I mean, you well, you saw he sued Disney shortly after that show started for because he figured, well, I'm I'm important now. I'm in the news. Got a lawyer and sued Disney for like eight or nine million for back pay for right. uh, for yeah for Bill Nye. Apparently, I don't know if they owe it to him, but huh. yeah, sorry, Bill Nye drives me insane. I, I hate him. I hate him so much. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So um, well, we got about two minutes before the break. Um, right. yeah. uh, when you were talking about your loading, uploading your flat earth clues, did you do them one at a time or did you like upload them yeah. all at the no, same time? No, I, man, I didn't even know what they were going to be from day to day. So literally talk about ins inspiration. And I know some people said, well, you know, it was, it was divine influence. I don't know. Maybe, but uh, at the same time, I literally uploaded one a day. I did the first seven clues in eight days, literally from inception, you know, wake, wake up in the same sort of thing, wake up early in the morning, writing the narrative, putting on the headset, recording the voice, and then putting the slides to it and then and refining it, you know, as best I could. You know, I did getting a little better at the video stuff. And then I slowed down a little bit. It was it was out of my head. It felt really like I had to get it out of my head. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's like my blog. Same thing. Yeah. It's a, I, it's I, a brain dump. Get it out. <laughs> it is. It, that's what it was. I, I had to. I had to. It was like, oh, got to go. Gotta, you know, because if I didn't, I thought I was my head was going to explode. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, by the time I got to clue eight, then all of a sudden, yeah, people, people started calling and then it started slowing down. But I will say this. Most people don't ask for people say, when are you going to do a new clue? I'm going. What are you talking about? All the other – everyone's been working on the clues. They've been doing their own versions of the clues. They yeah. just haven't numbered them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I could I could make another clue if I tried right now. How many rocks are left that we haven't un uh, uncovered except for the, the, the main ones, the brass rings? So, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I, I, did, uh, I did them as fast as I could. So one at a time. So in – well, we got thirty seconds left, but why did like you start that? with the movies? That's yeah, that's that's the one. I'm <laughs> that's one. You know, I still to this day, I know we're gonna go break. I still to this day mention that Rob thinks that that's my worst clue. <laughs> I still to this day, which is fine. That's why we when we come back from break. I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll break it down for you a little bit. All right, going to break. We'll talk <laughs> some more when we get back. I hope you're well. Spot. You are now tuned into the truth frequency. Your protection from, 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 from deception. This is Truth Frequency Radio.
and we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba, for the second hour of the broadcast. I'm talking with my guest, Mark Sargent. And right before the break, uh, we were talking about this sort of the setup for how Flat Earth, Flat Earth Clues got started. And uh, the first one being the empty theater. Right. Uh, now, you also have an introduction. Did that introduction come later? No, no, no. The intro was that early. No, no. The introduction w was first. I mean, that was oh, okay. the sum. That was the summary. But okay. then I had to. I, I did want to lead in with something. And so, again, I know you're you're my my biggest critic when it comes to the first clue, but that <laughs> but that's okay because that's good because I, I I enjoy telling that story to people because yeah, it's not it's not a great clue. It's not super powerful. It doesn't really convince people of anything. It's just more of a head scratcher. And I made it first because of kind of how I got into it, meaning when I heard the whole uh, Matt going to the NASA party, kind of a fun type of thing, we, uh, let's face it, you know, the average person out there is, I mean, we have so much media in our lives, so many televisions, so many movies, and I'm such a huge movie fan yeah. that it really, that was one of those things that really struck at me first, which was, look, I know media, and I, I love media. I love absorbing all, all sorts of stuff. I, I know plot lines and I know, you know how Hollywood works, kind of, you know, when it comes to, you know, if there's a nickel to be made, there's going to be a movie made about it. And I remember looking through this and I was going, wait a minute. And, but so it, the reason why it was first is because I couldn't fit it any place else. I, it, it, was, it was like I couldn't just, you know, you can't go, oh, OK, Bird Wall and then map makers, movies. You know, I couldn't I wasn't going to go that route. So I said, I'm just going to lead in really, really slow, because if if the if you got through the intro, the intro usually hooked people anyway. I mean, still yeah. to this day, even now, I think I've got how many on my phone, two or three people because I put my phone number during the intro. People would be calling. I'm 20 minutes in your movie and uh, I'm calling you because I had some questions, which is a phone call I'm never going to answer again because it's like, look. <laughs> watch you, the rest of it. Get back to me. Yeah, you watch the rest of it. Yeah, don't call me after 20 minutes because, you, in fact, I've had people call me after the plane flight things in seven and then only to call me back and say, no, no, I watched Clue 9. You're okay. You're off the hook. <laughs> so when I did the movies, I was really curious because, I'm a, you, like you, I'm a huge science fiction fan. And yeah. I knew growing up in the perfect year of movies leading up to what I can still consider the greatest year in movies, 1999, was the lack, the absence of based on a true story movie about the mo about about the Apollo program. And I was, you know, I was in high school when Apollo, I'm sorry, when the right stuff came out. Right stuff. Yeah. And the right stuff, which was a fantastic movie. I mean, it would yeah. have won best picture. But it came it came second only to you know what what won best picture that year? No, Gandhi, Gandhi <laughs> with Ben Kingsley. Yeah, oh. it, 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 I didn't watch it either. But the point <laughs> was is that look, if Ben Kingsley playing Gandhi, he was gonna win. There was yeah. no other movie that, that was gonna beat beat out Gandhi. Yeah, but awesome. but uh, the right stuff was second only to that. I mean, it won a whole bunch of Academy Awards. But it was really the whole movie, as you know, it was three hour three hours and what eleven twelve minutes long. Which yeah. was long for a movie in the eighties. I oh, mean, yeah. e even even James Cameron has a tough time stretching it out to three hours ten minutes. Yeah. And it was just an astronaut recruiting program. That's all it was. It was it, that's all the movie touched on. It's like, okay, how many different tests and how many astronaut poses and everybody's looking great and thumbs up, go America. That's what the movie was about, and it was set up for a sequel. You know, it, 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 the low Earth orbit. That was the last shot. Yeah, you know, that was the a thing. It never did. Because I, I remember when you were we were talking the first time, I think maybe even the first interview. Yeah, uh, you were like, "There's no movies about." I'm like, "Yeah, there are. There's this. There's that." And you're like, "Yeah, but they didn't show the landing on no. the moon. They didn't." And I'm like, no. well, "I actually went back and watched it again after that." And I'm like, "He's right." Yeah. Oh no, Apollo 13. I was sitting in the theater after three hours and ten minutes, going, and you know, and the, the credits <laughs> roll. I'm going, "Wait, that's it." Is all we got? I mean, you know, and sequels weren't that big back in the early 80s. And so I was going, uh, all right, well, I'm, I guess that's it. And and nobody ever covered that again until Apollo 13. And Apollo 13, let's face it, that was a production yeah. gold mine because it was just shot inside the capsule. Oh, yeah. That was the whole thing. It's like, how much money did you make off that? Because you you spent nothing to make it except for casting. Yeah. So. And that was literally, you know, and, and Apollo 13, the only one that's, you know, that didn't land or, or it was, yeah, they, they picked it because it had problems. But 
if you want. You can say, oh, yeah, you remember that Moon movie? People go, yeah, yeah. I go, really? Which was it? And they'll go, uh, uh. And, you know, th- that we, you can see their wheels spinning. I'm going, there is none. Trust me. I know. I've looked. And I've had people quote me, oh, of course, the obvious stuff, like uh, Moon with Sam Rockwell about clone, you know, how you're doing eugenic cloning on the moon to have workers work on the moon. That's yeah. obviously not true. And yeah. my favorite is Apollo 18. Oh my God. Yeah. If one more person <laughs> sends me Apollo 3. I go about the little rock monsters that, that yeah. turn into crabs and eat astronauts. Come on. Come on. There was no Apollo 18. So, um, yeah, so that was my big thing with, with clue one was, it was just to get people to understand the thought process, which is, Look, you you fill in the gaps. We fill in the gaps with media. We assume there's things there. I mean, we've watched so many fictionalized space movies and so many movies about the near future that we just kind of overlay them on top of where we are now. I mean, honestly, if you went to the average person in the street, not to say the average person is dumber than a bag of wet hair, but if you went to the average person in the street and said, oh, yeah, by the way, did you know we landed on Mars two years ago? I bet you you could get a whole bunch of people to believe you. Because... And yeah, Mark Dice does stuff like that, you know, where he's just oh, kind of yeah. man, on, man on the street. <laughs> he listens to oh. some of the things. People are like, what? I, I was actually glad, by the way, that Dice did not show up. I was kind of worried that someone like him might show up at that at yeah, the conference because yeah. he would just be a mess. And yeah. we'd, we'd probably have to toss him. But <laughs> but the, the point is, seriously, really <clears throat> But the point is, is that people, we fill in the gaps with, with things. Look, I mean, how many, there's so many, like Mission to Mars or Red Planet or Interstellar or, oh God, uh, what was that one that Matt Damon just did uh, recently? Well, other than San- Sandra Bullock's Gravity. Um, I, can't, I can't even remember the Matt Damon movie where he yeah. got off the freaking, but they even that movie, they blended in reality where they yeah. said, oh yeah, he the reason he got off was, he dug up the real Mars rover and used the parts to, to, to get off the planet. I'm going, oh, my God, that is the most horrible reinforcement. That's why we fill in the gaps. And it's it, again, it was again, it was not my my best clue, but it was fun for me to make because I was so sure about the info. It was it meaning it's like, look, I know I absolutely know for a fact there aren't any moon movies. So don't try to tell me that there are. And I'll even go one step further and say, because remember, Hollywood will make if it's a, there's a nickel to be made, they will make movies off of it. So why was there no sequel made to Apollo 13? I mean, for God's sakes, how many earnest movies were were made? You know, back in the day, remember all those <laughs> stupid movies? Oh my God, they made a sequel to Paul Blart Mall Cop. For <laughs> right. God's sakes, and, the, and you're telling me the, the and there's not even and that that's where it gets creepy. You know, silent producers how they can kill projects, where there's not even a, a moon movie that went straight to DVD. And, you know, those are, those are a dime a dozen down in Hollywood. You know, they, you start yeah. off a project, it never makes it to theaters, and it goes straight to the DVD thing. There's not even one of those. And that's when I started thinking, okay, this thing is very quietly being, it's like, oh, you're thinking about doing an Apollo project? Uh-huh. We're going to assign you uh, these two producers over here, and then, silent, you know, over the next five months, they're going to kill this project. They're just going to run into the ground. You know, creative differences, salary, you know, money issues, can't get casting blah 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 and it seemed to work and to where now here we are 2017 and there's the you know and, and in fact i even heard a story in 2016 that that somebody was was gonna make a big budget apollo movie i'm going no you're not you can't uh for for the very simple reason that once you go down that production road it rings to tr- it's too close meaning all of a sudden you you get a major studio you get mgm right start working on that thing those guys start building the set and they start looking at the dailies. What do you think happens? They're going to look at the dailies going, wow. This, <laughs> you know, you know, Frank, it'd be really easy to create our own space. Hey, wait a minute. You know? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Did you see Operation Avalanche? <laughs> no, I haven't seen it yet, but I oh, want to. Is it, is it worth dude. it? Oh, yeah, totally worth it. You have got to watch Operation Avalanche. Oh, God. Yeah. For sure. I, I don't know if you were in there when I mentioned it, but, I mean, there was a really – I mean, as, as a movie goes – well, it's it's sort of like a Blair Witch Project kind of look to it, like it's a you know found, handy found cam kind of yeah. yeah, like found footage. It's like it's meant to be like this has been dug up since like 1969. You know, it's been hidden away and yeah. you know that kind of stuff. So so they did a really good job of making it look like a period piece, right? With, with all of the sets, props, cars, outfits, everything. 
Uh, but there was a really good line in there, and I mentioned it in my presentation, where they're like, you know, how how are we gonna pull this off? How are we gonna how are we gonna you know convince everybody? And they're like, look, we don't have to convince everybody. We just have to convince Walter Cronkite. Yeah. And because if he believes it, and this is the power of media, yeah. is and I, and I was like, what a brilliant line in the movie because everybody's like, it's too big, it's too big a conspiracy, too many people have to be in on it and all this. No, if he all he a guy like him has to be sold on it, and I believe he was sold on it, and yeah. because he believed it, and because of his passion and you know, excitement, everybody else who looks to him as a trusted news source right. believed simply because he believed. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Because we trust you. You have to put trust in someone. And, you know, putting trust in the media, it's something that's ingrained in us when when we're very, very young. I did a quick little video uh, last year when I was up in Canada where uh, I was talking about how, again, kind of like those lines, the faith in media. And I showed a clip. I don't know if you've ever seen this where CNN comes on. It was during one of the holiday things. And you'll see where I'm going. Where Wolf Blitzer comes out with, I think it was not Candy Crowley, but one of the Pentagon correspondents, and they're talking about how Santa Claus this year is going to be escorted by F-18 fighter planes from the United States Air Force. Yeah, and they're it's not tongue in cheek. I mean, they are straight through talking yeah. about. It. They've got graphics and the whole nine yards. And then there's other countries complaining because you, the United States, shouldn't have a mon- monopoly on Santa Claus's time. And I'm watching this thing going. Don't you see how you know how easy it is? Because there's kids watching this, right? Yeah. And I know it's for the kids. It's it's just a bigger version of the local version. It's like Santa on radar, you know that yeah. whole thing. But the point is, is that we, it, just because you get to a certain age, you don't b- believe in Santa Claus anymore. There's some topics that ne- there is no age limit, and it's, it because you know the media what they throw out there, we believe is gospel. And, Look at War of the Worlds. I mean, yeah. That- oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I the actually radio. have a copy of that, uh, of the audio of that, and the book about it. And what I mean, because we're talking early days of, yeah. of radio and media, you know, right, right, it, right. It, when it's in everybody's homes, you know, and you know, I, and, and the brilliance of it is the way they described the alien ships or creatures or what have you. Yeah. It it basically the description of it was very similar. If you're listening to it in your mind to what a water tower looks like. Right. And so, you know, people, you know, they're listening to this and they're just, you know, these are like a, you know, round thing with these long straight legs and blah, blah, <laughs> blah. And, you know, they're listening to this because they just got home from work. If you missed the five minute disclaimer at the beginning saying this is a play by whatever, because <laughs> they did give said. a, discri- they did give a disclaimer at the beginning, but it's, you know, like the first minute. Yeah. So you got home from work, you missed the first minute or whatever, you turn it on, your trusted news source is describing this. Yeah. And you look out the window. Now, there's the water tower. It's been there for 50 years. But, uh, yeah. you know, all of a sudden your mind, you know, you're, <laughs> you, you're like, oh, my God, they're in our neighborhood, you know? Yeah. And oh, people yeah, yeah. The, totally the, flipped out. The power of media. And I actually was, was giving – I threw that back. It was a good thing you mentioned that. I was throwing that back to the guy from BuzzFeed because he was talking. He was trying to remember, trying to demonize the internet, saying how the internet can, can convince us of anything. I go, really? Is it any different – then the technologies we've had previously, before the internet, there was television. Before there was television, there was radio. Before there was radio, there were newspapers. We believe the media. Yeah. Whatever the press tells us. Now, of course, it doesn't take people very long, the very, very rich people. In fact, oh, was it Getty? Or was it one? Of, I think it was Getty or one of the old, you know, when a newspaper starts talking bad about a very wealthy person, what do you, you, know, what do you think happened? The wealthy person figured, well, how can I stop the media from doing that? Oh, I know. I'll, I'll buy just- them. I'll buy them. <laughs> and I bought, they bought the newspapers and they bought the radio. And look, very wealthy people talk to each other. It's like, hey, man, you don't want any, any, any dissension in the ranks. Just freaking buy that network. It's like, <laughs> right. okay. And yeah, then they five, did. Five corporations own all of the media in this right. country now. Right. Yeah. And that time, that time Warner story, I told you, was just a fraction of it, which was, look, they need to make more money off this movie. Sh- slow down the review process as quickly as you can. And, and that review process was basically a compilation of every newspaper in the country. And they basically said, don't let any newspaper in the country review this movie until we say so. It's, yeah, but you made the movie. Yeah, I know it's a little bit of a conflict of interest. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> we'll deal with it. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, the media has immense power and we believe it. Uh, why wouldn't we? Uh, we're, we're trained to, uh, which is why, you know, 
I, I get frustrated, of course, like with anybody, and which is why I have a hard time bringing up the co- other conspiracies. You have to question, you know me, I, you'll question everything. Uh, like you. I, I heard that thing about your childhood. I thought that was great about how you oh, it's like he questions everything. But yeah. it's true, though. You can't just take everything at face value because people lie. And just because they come at you and smile and look pretty for the camera and say, well, we're not going to lie doesn't mean they're not lying. It just be, or or in their case, you know, they're just um, I, I hate to use a Ron Burgundy line, but for, from Anchorman. But it's true. It's like, look, they're they're news readers. The very few journalists anymore. It's all just, you know, grab the content, edit, edit down and read the teleprompter. Yeah. And a lot of the times they don't even know what they're reading. You know, I, I never would consider Wolf Blitzer a serious journalist, even though you see him every night. And he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He's just reading a, a list of words on the screen. So, yeah. Anyway. So early on. So early on, when it comes to like conspiracies, you talked about the JFK issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how early did you pick up on 9/11 and the moon landings? Uh, 9/11. Well, moon landings all moon landings always bugged me, but I think I really? told you. Oh yeah, moon landings always bugged me because uh, in, because the the photography and all the data did not age well. <sighs> you know, any anything in media, as you know, just if it's especially if it's not authentic. Because techn, you know, uh, special yeah, effects. They didn't change. count on, yeah, they didn't count yeah. on special effects and Photoshop mm, and stuff. No, oh my God, Photoshop has screwed up so many operations over the years. Yeah. But in this, in this case, um, the, what what bugged me about Apollo was the why. Uh, and I'll tie back to flat Earth real quick, which is, I always thought it was fake, but I couldn't come up with a good enough reason why. I mean, yeah, yeah, raise the flag, America, go team, rah, rah. Cold, Cold War. Cold War, we win, you lose, all that crap. That was a good answer, but it wasn't a great answer. Then when I looked into Flat Earth, I thought, okay, okay, that, that makes more sense. Because it's not, again, it's not that they wanted to fake the Apollo program. They had to. They yeah. absolutely had to get that space program militarized and do it as quickly as possible and do a bunch of missions, make it real boring, close it all down. Good night, everybody. And that was it. 1972, they just <laughs> shut They just shut the whole thing down. Um, when it came to, to 9-11, uh, I had, because I was working with a bunch of guys who were doing business travel, the initial shock, like anybody else, you know, we brought a television into the office and, and we had actually guys on the road that couldn't fly back because they shut down the, the, all the airspace. And... I didn't think about much of it. Honestly, it wasn't until um, – because how much stuff was out on it back then. Remember, YouTube was not yeah, even – uh, it wasn't until um, – oh, boy. Uh, what was the documentary, the big one that came out? Loose Change. change. Loose yeah. change. change. Yeah, and once I saw that, it was like, okay. And that was the beginning for me. To It opened the doors to where as more and more stories came out and then you know you started looking. But again, you still have that knee-jerk reaction. The first time I heard of No Planes, I was like – Come on, come yeah. on! I saw I saw the video again. You you fall back into your old habits. It's like I saw it on TV. It was right there in front of me. It was on CNN. It's why yeah. it's not like seeing. Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and and then you know. But for me, uh, let me throw in one real quick on that. Is that for me? It came down to ballistics more than anything. Uh, I shoot. I, I've I've shot all my life, and and uh, I always have. And. When it came out of bullets, if you know anything about shooting, you can shoot, well, you know, military, you can shoot bullets, you know, lead bullets at a, at a steel target and you're, you're not punching through that steel target anytime soon. That's no. lead on steel, right? Yeah. You try to shoot that with aluminum bullets, <laughs> right. your gun's going to wear out before that steel target. And then if you shoot with hollow aluminum bullets, <laughs> oh my God, I mean, you could, you could go through a million rounds of ammunition. I, I mean, the, the things holding the steel target will probably wear out and fall before or even the cement. Oh my God! Yeah, you'll it'll, you'll grow old, and you, <laughs> oh God, eons will go by. So, and you're saying, what, what's the point? Well, okay, if if you can't fire a hollow aluminum bullet through a steel target, it in a plane, really, a jet airplane is just a hollow, a very slow, mind you, that's slower than yeah. a 45 caliber bullet, a very slow hollow aluminum bullet. Yeah. How are you punching through two feet of steel, reinforced steel? And and even if you could convince me, even if you convince me that the fuselage had enough force, kinetic energy behind it to punch it through, you know, the tube, the tube, yeah. those wings would have pancaked on the side oh, of that yeah. thing and, and dropped fluttered, on the ground. 
fluttered down. It would have been a dead bird made out of metal. That's yeah. all it would have been. And yet that plane disappeared. I will say this. Once I started looking at the, the subtle t- nuances of that, I'm going, oh. Because I used to make fun of 9-11. I was going, it is a piece of crap operation. It, it was just horrible production value. Once I saw that, though, I was going, okay, these guys actually got way better <laughs> at doing stuff. Uh, yeah, but know. like the, you know, I played that uh, the Corbett report, uh, three minute spiel of making fun of 9 11. Yeah. Um, and it's talking about making a 270 degree corkscrew turn to land, to, to get completely level on the ground, hitting the budget, budget analyst office, you know, where Donald Rumsfeld had announced $2.3 trillion missing the day before. Right. I had gone to visit my family in Massachusetts uh, about a month ago, right. and it was a two-leg flight on the way home, and I flew into Washington, D.C., yeah. and the flight path that we took, I I just happened to look out the window as we were landing. I was reading our book or whatever I was doing. I don't know. But, you know, as we are landing, I just so happened to look out the window, and I looked out exactly at the moment when we were on final approach passing the Pentagon. Oh, wow. And, and the, you know, the Pentagon was, like, right out my window. I'm looking at yeah. it. I'm going, there's no freaking way. Right. And in ex- even an experienced pilot could have done that. Oh, no. Much less a guy could barely pilot a, you know, a Cessna, you know, I'm going, and, and I read to be fair, you know, on the, the day it happened before the top of the, the roof of the Pentagon collapsed when it was just the hole Yeah. and they had the news coverage of it. I remember the day it happened, looking at that going, that's, it, where's the plane? Right. Like, where's the markings on the side where the wings and the engines should have hit? Where, yeah. Where's the plane? Like, I remember saying that the day it happened. Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid like everybody else. When, um, when the BuzzFeed guy was asking me, you know, he was asking about other conspiracies. I'm going to tell you what, I'll make it easy for you. You ask me any conspiracy, I'll answer it in one sentence. That's how, you know, I boned up on conspiracies I consider myself to be. And he goes 9-11. And for me, I go, building seven, yeah. period. And and because most people still to this day, a lot of Americans do not know that Building know 70 it. even dropped. And for me, uh, I, know, I know we got a few minutes to the break. I got to mention this real quick because the the thing for me was I was in the time and attendance industry at the time. I was teaching proprietary software for a time and attendance company. If you don't know what that is, that's time clock software. We knew everything there was to be know about time, military time, uh, normal time uh, and time zones. That was our big thing. So when a British television team comes on comes on yeah. TV and they yeah. report Building 7 dropping 20 minutes before it actually dropped, right. when it's actually smoldering in the background, I knew what happened the second I saw that clip because I was going, oh, my. Because remember, it took a while for the, for, the, for the London journalists to get over there. They had to fly over the Atlantic. So yeah. by the time they got there, they got their script handed to them, like, you know, and you know how that goes. And they were told, you're going to report on this, and somebody screwed up the time zone. So yeah. instead of reporting the building falling 40 minutes after, they reported it 20 minutes before. Yeah. And I was going – and that right there is like, look, it, there, there it is. The, you're reporting a building falling way – you know, be, decent amount of time before it even dropped – how, you know, a building that was not hit by a plane. They got yeah. greedy. And you know, again, to this day, there's still people. Rosie O'Donnell, a perfect example. She mentions Building 7 on The View, and she was banned from that show for, what, three, four years? Yeah. Because she even mentioned it. That's how serious it was. It was like, oh, no, no, you're not talking about that. So. Yeah, crazy. So yeah. What, what year was it? What, so you came on right about the same time as uh... – Loose Change came out. I'm trying to think when that was. was that 2004, I 2005. I, 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 I first saw it in 2006, but it had was, been around for a little while. That 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 documentary just intrigued me. Uh, there were so many cool things about it. And I remember the early versions yeah. where like they were. Three, four versions of it yeah, now. Yeah, uh, where they had said that, there, that one of the planes had something akin to a missile launcher on the bottom side. And that they were forced to remove those pictures because. Now, Boeing's pretty touchy anyway. I'm from the Boeing country. Con- con- country up here and boeing basically threatened to sue them they said you leave us the hell out of this uh-huh. we you know do not say that we made a special military plane with a mil- missile launcher on it now it turns out it probably wasn't true yeah. but uh, but at the same time boeing is like but you know lawyers it's like yeah, yeah. we don't stop mentioning our com- our company there i think they just want the name boeing out of the documentary entirely yeah and they did they they got it pulled but it got me it got me thinking about a lot of different things and then by the time I got to uh, uh, what Dr. Judy Wood's energy weapons thing, I was like, "Oh my <laughs> lord, 
where where are we here? I mean, it, whether or not whether or not you believe in the energy weapon theories, there's some really interesting footage about what happened. And yeah. you know, if you look at the wreckage, it's like there is, it is interesting that you don't have any twisted, crumpled up metal desks or no. pieces of this or pieces of that. It's just the the Ash. most. Oh, yeah, it's the most elegant rubble you've ever seen in your life. And they carted it off so quickly uh, to where, uh, yeah. It, it, look, <laughs> the old tricks are the best tricks. The the Reichstag fire, <laughs> yeah. look, it happened. So don't think it can happen again just because we, we have better technology. In fact, it's easier yeah. now. Yeah, well, Robbie Davidson uh, called it right. He's like, you, when you're talking to people about flat earth, you really got to feel them out on at least those two first, 9-11 and yeah. the, the issue of the moon landing. Right. And if, if they're still buying the official story of either one of them, talk about sports, walk away. Whatever. Yeah, no, I, you know, yep. Time to change I, the subject. <laughs> I, I heard you say that to the nightline person. That was perfect because you're absolutely right. There's some people, you know, to use a movie, you just can't reach. You can't go there. All nope. right. We'll talk some more when we come back from the break. listening to the Truth 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 Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I'm your host, Rob Skiba, for the final half-hour segment of the broadcast. I'm talking with my guest, Mark Sargent. So, um, Mark, you got sort of introduced to the topic of Flat Earth in 2014. Yep. You create the, the clues in the beginning of 2015, and then yep. sometime in 15 and 16, you're off and running, yeah. doing lots of shows, and then you start your own show. You've got, you've got a show here on TFR also, yep. uh, doing interviews with people, and here we are, 2017, and we have this first annual <laughs> Flat Earth International Conference. Yeah. What were your thoughts about. Uh, my wow. initially, my initial thoughts were amazing, wonderful, fantastic. That I would be, hum I, I am humbled to be a part of something that's never happened in the what 241 year of the United States, and 500 years of Western civilization, you know, the modern world as we know it, and it wasn't even wasn't even a maybe. That you know, uh, the the VIP tickets sold out amazingly, amazingly fast, and all the people that came and the speakers we put together, the the people that were involved, I, it was it was more than I could have I could have hoped for. The the energy in the room because I had done several meetups before this, and this had been like my eighth official meetup, and every one of them was you know even with groups of you know twenty and thirty people were just super super excited about it, and I met so many fantastic people. And they were all, it, it was a validation that I had been waiting for the entire year, but I think it was a validation for everybody else, which was kind of like a mini version of what we were, you know, what the message is like, you are not alone. You've never been alone. Same thing with this. You're not the only one that believes in this. There are a whole bunch of people out there that believe in it. And to get them in a room, it's really cathartic because all of a sudden you're in a room where you you're not worried about judging, you know, judgment from your family, from your friends, from your coworker. You know that the person sitting next to you is absolutely on the same page with you. Now, yeah, they may disagree on a few little little things here and there. That's to be expected. But for the most part, that and then the energy starts building and starts building and nobody slept. I slept horribly for the first <laughs> two nights. I I was so jacked up. Uh, and, and I rewrote my intro, you know, uh, for my, uh, for my Q and a thing like three or four times. And finally I asked somebody, I asked I literally one of the people that was with me, I go, you know what, what, what do you want me to do up there? He goes, dude, just get up there and let people talk to you. Well, you know, just bounce off questions and just get the, get the microphone in the crowd and just start talking to them. 
I said, you know what? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, and between that and the media, which, you know, I only knew of like three or four groups that were going to be there beforehand. And when I got there, it just kept coming in, it kept coming in. Uh, you, you, you put that, you saw it, you were there. I mean, you put that many cameras in, in the middle of a lobby with that many people. Oh, it's man. just, it's, it's chaos. Yeah, it was uh, like they're, they're boom mics hovering yeah. over every direction you turned yeah and you didn't you, know? you didn't you didn't know who they were either yeah you, you like you're like straining to look at badges like okay what camera what group were, this boom yeah. mic belongs who are you guys yeah uh and, and i stopped asking i just literally say like, whoever's tapped on my shoulder says hey you want to talk about it? okay fine point me wherever the camera is and i'll, I'll do it but it was it was uh, it was very well done uh security was fantastic i thought robbie did a, a great job uh, you know putting it together Considering the hurdles he had to go through, uh, I thought I thought it was very well done. And considering the uh, the, the roster changes we had to make over the yeah. last not, several, yes, hey, several. on the fly and, even like you know one the uh, a more guy was supposed to be there Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah, it's like but, uh, yeah, no, he's a no show. But that's a testament to if you know a sports metaphor, the depth of the flat Earth roster. Everybody knows this. What I love about the Flyers community so much is they they know a lot of the material. They've heard it. So where you put them, in, I'm not worried. It's like put him in front of a camera. Yeah, he may not get all of it, you know, verbatim or whatever. But he's gonna he's gonna be able to throw a lot of knowledge your way. And so when there was these last minute roster changes, oh my god, we stepped in. It was seamless. Like yeah, put Demar. Demar will open the show. Yeah, I can open the show. <laughs> he, opens, yeah. he opens the show. Morgyle's out. All right. Iru, you want to you be a Globuster? Yeah, I'd be a Globuster. All right. But Iru's a Globuster. <laughs> and, and this really, I mean, that that's how quickly, you know, things, but but, but it did not surprise <laughs> me. There were that many great people involved. Uh, and, and I was, for me, and you probably caught it too, uh, my favorite moment uh, was in the media and it wasn't uh, uh, necessarily, you know, I mean, yeah, of course, I love taking pictures with people and, and all that stuff. It was that early closed door meeting, that first security meeting we went to. Where <laughs> we were all sitting at that table because it was the first time we'd all been in the same room together. In fact, yeah. a lot of us is the first time we even met. Yeah. And we're all there sitting around the table. And I, it's, it's like, holy smokes, we're really going to do this. This is this is when I knew it's like, OK, this at this point forward, this is where this is where it really starts gaining ground because we're all here. No, you know, we's fighting. Nobody's, nobody's jabbing at each other. I mean, everyone's just smiling. You know, there's, there's no, the, the, it was the op absolute opposite of awkward moments in that room to where the volume started, started just ramping up and ramping up. And uh, I just, I just, it was, a, it was a really cool, cool moment for me. So yeah, whole conference loved it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, there are certainly differences of opinion uh, amongst the speakers that were there and whatnot. Of course, of course. Um, but you know, everybody realized, okay, we, we have a common goal here yeah. and, you know, at the core of it, we have a common belief. There are variations within that belief, but like, um, you know, on the religious aspect of things, you know, pastor Dean and I have been, you know, at each other's throats, you know, sparring for a, a while now. I did not, things. I did not know that by the way. Yeah. Yeah. We have some differing views, you know, from a religious, you know, spiritual, okay. bib biblical perspective on things, not necessarily related to flat earth, but, you yeah, know, but you weren't, you weren't throwing things. punches in the parking lot or anything. No, you know, it was really cool. Cause, um, he came in just as we were stepping out to go to, to uh, dinner. And, uh, I said, Hey Dean, you know, I shook his hand and stuff. And then he went and talked to some people and I was talking to some people and as I was just about to leave, he, he grabbed my shoulder and said, Hey, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure. So he pulls me aside. I said, Hey, listen, man, I just, I just want you to know, I, you know, I love you. I respect you. We have our disagreements, but you know, I, I consider you a brother. Yeah. I said, you know what, bro, you know, I, likewise, I mean, we can spar. I'm happy to spar with you. I don't mind, you know, yeah. but same thing. You know, I, I highly respect you. I think you're, you've done some great stuff and, you know, we're here, you know, we're in this together. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had some great times hanging out with him, you yeah. know, and um, but, you know, th that that was the thing that I thought was really cool is that even in our differences, yeah. you know, as far as I can tell, 
everybody was united. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah there was sure. a lot of mud slinging that came out afterwards, not from the attendees or the speakers. No, no, no. There was always going to be that though. I mean, let's face it. You know, if, if, a, if the cool, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, uh, if the cool kids have a party, there's always going to be people offended that it's not at their house. It's like, <clears> I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to that party. Eh, it's a suck party. Who wants to go to that party? I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> complain about it. It's like, dude, you were invited. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and of course all the accusations. Of course, you were getting some accusations even before it, you know, oh, yeah. with the ODD yeah. video and everything. And yeah. you know, to be frank, I you know, I saw I saw the video and the stuff that was being thrown around. I'm listening to the accusations. Yeah. And I don't know if you caught the show I did with uh, Robbie I Davidson. I did. I did. And thank you for that. I, 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 I did listen to you and Robbie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was yeah. like, look, you know, I'm in the web business. I know what it's like to, you know, get domains and, you know, whatever the situation. The, the, all the stuff that I saw that was coming against you, yeah. I'm going – well, there's some easy alternative answers to this that doesn't have to involve, you know, any kind of conspiracy. I know. And I know. since I... a video had just come out against me not too long prior, and I looked at the accusations that they were doing against me that I'm in with uh, Rick Warren with the, you know, and, oh, right. and, and, and yeah. I, you know, I've been on set with George Lucas. So, you know, I'm a Hollywood shell and I'm like, yeah. you really didn't do much research at all because that's a Photoshop picture of my face on Steven Spielberg's body. But, you know, you know, it was just, I saw the level of, I don't even want to use the word scholarship because it doesn't really apply, but <laughs> I, about to say, I wouldn't use that word, you know, but you know, that was the level of intelligence that people had that was attacking me. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't see it. And, you know, uh, again, the conspiracy world, as you know, and you met, you touched on this with your ABC uh, lady, which was, look, it, it trust is a hard thing to come by in the conspiracy world. And if you tracked like the conspiracy uh, trust level, you know, like a bell curve, there's people out there that absolutely will just jump on you at any hint of anything. You know, they will they will make a massive leap of faith to uh to come after you and and i put that challenge out there to the web i go look there is no webmaster out there worth his salt anybody that's had any experience with webmastering is never going to think that i that metatron was involved with me you know way before the clues i mean seriously i mean and jumping on the app thing it's like oh yeah his app was built in 2010 i said so what i was doing nothing for five years <laughs> until until and then i put out the clues but I had already I had already anticipated that I was going to need an app because a lot of people had apps back in 2010. Come on. Well, you were still in you know uh, psyop training school with the oh, Jesuits, uh, yes. the Freemasons, so you could yeah, have yeah all your down in Colorado out. Springs. No, I was drinking a bunch of wine and playing video games in 2010. <laughs> I was not <laughs> I was not doing anything constructive at all. I can absolutely <laughs> guarantee you that 2010 I was movies, wine, games, and not necessarily in that order. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was no, 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 no. So no, the trolls. No, I didn't mind them. And <laughs> and when it came to the conference, we had very few incidents of anything. I mean, there yeah. was only one incident, as you know, that I should yeah. probably comment on it real quick. The, the whole the 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 lovely Islamic lady who I knew. The the thing that I that killed me about that was when he went when she went after Dean Odell, right? Yeah. It was completely strategic. I absolutely she's a very clever woman. This one, right? First, she's a flat earther, and 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 people, you know, I I made this comment to other people. If you're listening, Miriam, <laughs> I get I get where you're coming from here. But she did nothing but help us because all she did was she she complained, dragged the, some of the cameras out with her because, you know, the cameras are bored. And I was like, oh, yeah, this, this could be interesting. <laughs> and she's complaining about her demographic not getting enough flat earth representation. It's like that's gold. It's like we think the Islamic community, the female Islamic community should get more flat earth representation. Are you kidding? Do you know what sort of message that sends? There's people out there I'm right now. It's like, wait, does the Rainbow Coalition need like a flat earth representation? <laughs> it's like, well, it's like well, you know, there's other minorities out there by their groups that are probably now thinking there's a flat earth rep gap happening as we speak. And all that's all she did. It's like she wasn't a globalist attacking. She was just a flat earther uh, complaining that there wasn't enough camera time. So, yeah, good. well, she got upset. About, I mean, to be fair, there was an awful lot of 
um, Christianese that was being speak, oh, spoken throughout well, the week. Yes, 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 there was. I no, no. I but but that wasn't her point. She yeah. picked, she picked him because it was easy. You know, it was like okay. You know, in fact, she told me I should have seen it. Honestly, she was talking to me just before she went in there, and she's going, "There's you know a Christian man in there talking. You know that you know, Christianity shouldn't hijack the conference." I was going, "Well." Right. You know, the, 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 the producer is Christian, so he can angle it any way he wants. So, but, well, anyway, but I'm just saying that it, it worked out. For, it, it didn't hurt, hurt us in the slightest because, again, she wasn't – if she was a globalist complaining, that would be a whole other thing. But for her, it was like, no, no, no. We need more. Basically, she was not shy. We need more Islamic people in flat earth. We need more women. It's like, all right. Did she, did she actually say that out there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. she said she wasn't Muslim. She said her father was, but I know well, she was into you know goddess worship and you all know, right, all right. Go- okay, okay. So she's and- not. She. I'm sorry. She's not. Maybe I'm. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take that part back. She not may not be a practicing Muslim. Uh, however, she's a very proud Iranian woman. Yeah. So it, her, it, you know, very culture. Very, yeah, and I will say this. Look, she was one of. Uh, I got to give her credit where credit is due. She's one of the first flat Earth women I even met. Because in fact, it's irony. The the you know those flash drives I was handing out to people. I have actually yeah. have a sample folder in there, a folder called sample voicemails. And there's only four voicemails in there that I picked. One of them is hers. Huh. Yeah. Where she's actually saying, Oh, flat earth changed my life and it's so great and wonderful. And it was very sincere and very passionate, very heartfelt. So I I, I know what she was doing. She was she was no extremist. <laughs> very, very clever. Anyway, yeah. Well, that was the only, the only disturbance. The only thing I was aware of uh, yeah. that took place, and you know, I, I actually, and I, I said this during the conference. Somebody asked me what my take on that was, and I was like, you know, what? I actually understand both positions here. Right. You know, Dean is a pastor. He's an evangelical Christian pastor, so he's going to do what evangelical pastors do. So if you ask an evangelical pastor to take the stage, well, you know, he's going to do what pastors do, you know, and it, I'm all for it. Yeah, right on. She's not on that page. And nope. she's like, look, I came here for a flat earth conference, not a Christian crusade. Right. Um, okay. You know, I, I think the way it was ultimately handled was done appropriately. You know, oh, yeah. Dean's like, Dean's like, look, I love you. You know, you you weren't asked to speak, you know, <laughs> I was, and you know, right. so, you know, it was what it was, but um, I mean, it could have been worse. Let's put it this way: it, that was not a Q and A panel. No, it wasn't Q and A. It was right. It was right in the middle of his his talk. Thank God she didn't have a microphone. <laughs> it, it could have been bad, but but at the same time, hey, it gave security something to do. I mean, they were they were pretty <laughs> well, and, quiet. You know, and, you know uh, to Robbie's credit, and and John Gabrielson, um, you know, was brought in to help out. Also, they they had a really tight security. Yes, they did. Uh, operation going on there. And a lot of people didn't, you know, we had that little private meeting, so we were introduced to some of these people. But, right. you know, the audience at large didn't have a clue who was standing or sitting next to them that, you know, was actually part of the security detail. Right. And um, Oh, no, any anybody would have had any given us any trouble. And t- to be fair, uh, I'll take a little bit of blame for this because I was, you know, the one that got the, this, the, the actual threat before this thing actually happened. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't have taken it, and I don't know if I, I told you, I wouldn't have taken it very seriously, uh, but the person in question um, uh, bought several tickets. Oh, to, to it as like somebody's uh, planning on doing something to you. Well, I was that was implied, and I was going, all right. Well, if you're gonna go down that road, then. Uh, but the security was already in place at that yeah. time, and they were very, very good. I mean, there was contingency for just about anything, and yeah. it, they were they were great. I I, I loved them. Yeah, and, and in fact, I was looking through the photographs. Uh, you know, they, you know, a lot of a lot of still shots were taken. I only spotted them a couple times, even yeah. in the photographs. They're yeah. very, very invisible. Yeah, yeah, they did a great job. So, yeah. um, wow, I mean, meetup groups, yeah. uh, conferences, billboards, it, billboards. <laughs> yeah, I, we, yeah, I forgot to mention. Well, I mentioned it earlier, but that's how the the weekend started. Was yeah. uh, who put that billboard up? Do you know that particular billboard was done by uh, DITRH. Oh really? And, yeah, yeah. He that, was the one that. that was David? And, yeah, and funny enough, the website he mentions on it was ODDs. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. Why? Why not? Uh, but yeah, he was the one that, that that took care of that, and he did a great job and got the drone out there. And then he went yeah. back the second day because HBO wanted to. They they wanted uh, some more footage of it, and so then he took some long distance drone shots. He got better with the drone, and that I think they're going to definitely use in the. Um, 
uh, the thing. Yeah, well, I think it's coming out this weekend. I'm oh, gonna take. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. I honestly, they shot so much footage. They should be able to do a bigger piece than than just straight up Vice News. But you never know. I you know, who who knows with those guys. They shot for three days, and uh, I mean, I can't imagine they condense it down to ten minutes. But if they have to, they have to. So. Well, I gotta say that was pretty cool. I mean, we I I booked. The, about the only flight that I could get that wasn't going to make me wake up at three o'clock in the morning uh, that could get me there. I got, we got there, Sheila and I got there at like two yeah. and it just turned out that the guy that was sitting behind me yeah. uh, who, who lives, you know, here in the North Dallas area uh, was attending the conference. Sheila uh, had to use the bathroom. So I got, I stood up, you know, so she could get out. I, she was in the window seat. I was in the middle. Yeah. And so I'm standing up and the guy that was sitting behind me is like, Rob Skiba, hey, he's like, I, I, you're the reason I'm coming to this conference. I'm like, wow. So we start talking, and uh, it turns out he had a rental car. Oh, wow. So, uh, and this other guy, Matthew Long, uh, that I had met at the conference in Austin that I was at just a few weeks prior, yeah. uh, you know, we were all trying to figure out how we were going to get to the hotel and how to get to the billboard. And this guy's like, yeah, I got a rental car. So we're like, cool. So we, nice. we, jumped, we jumped in the rental car, and literally, it looks like we got there like, right at the moment you guys were ready to do your thing right uh, and uh so it was like perfect timing of course it was kind of cold and rainy but yeah it wasn't it wasn't the best conditions but that's a testament to the the dedication of the the group you know they didn't complain let's walk through the the wet grass and you know it's <laughs> Slide down the hill. The well that's just it nobody was supposed to park down there it, we, there was a back parking lot on the on the other side but nobody knew that so once the first person pulled over i'm going you know what everybody's gonna pull over now try yeah. to climb that hill and I'm watching patricia in those heels was going it's yeah. just gonna be fun yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah, what we good. did and yeah. you know it was cool because as soon as we got there i know everybody was getting organized for the picture but it was kind of like you're looking around like Jaron, hey man, David, yeah. hey man. It was like everybody's just kind of looking around at who's around them, and yeah. you know, it's cool to actually, you know, finally shake hands, hug, and you know, meet the people, meet you, you yeah. know, in person. And uh, that, that was that was, it was really it was a great way to start the whole thing off. I thought yeah. it was great. Um, let me let me tell you a quick thing on how it ended for me because I left on on Saturday afternoon, and I was as you know just wiped out. I was so tired, and, and Patricia had already done like three podcasts. I was like I really coffee can can pull you out of this and, but i know she slept more than i did so i get to the airport i'm just i'm trying to hide right it's like okay he's gonna see me right? Right. he's gonna see me and i sure enough i get to my gate and who is literally sitting and i didn't even tell her i was leaving for the airport but patricia she's literally in the gate next to me you know she's going to houston i'm going to seattle we're literally within 10 15 feet of each other it's like oh fantastic so we're um there's another guy sitting next to her you know another a guy from the conference and she gets on her plane and I think, oh, great. Well, you know, I can get a sandwich, maybe come back in a nap, you know, and I come back and there's half a dozen of them now sitting around, you know, wait, just very, pretty much waiting for me when I get there. It's like, oh, God. So <laughs> we, we, you know, I'm not sleeping. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm going. And finally, you know, my flight leaves fairly late. And I'm going, OK, I'll just get on the plane. I'll be fine. Right. <laughs> There's freaking four of us, uh, not even the same group I was talking to. There's another four flat earthers on the flight yeah. with me. And. One of them sitting like right behind me across the aisle and to my left, another one. And, and so I'm passing out T-shirts, you know, T-shirts I've already worn during the thing. It's like, here, I'm sure, here, I'm sure. <laughs> a you know, smelly and, shirt by Mark Sargent. Well, luckily I didn't smell that or anything. Okay. But yeah, it's, like, it's like pre-worn. Basically, it's Mark Sweat. It's like, I'll never wash it. So I, so I, I'm so sitting next. It's a six-hour flight, you know, from, yeah. from that to the West Coast up to the Northwest. And so I'm, I'm flying back. And I, you know how you sometimes sit to somebody, next to somebody on the plane. So it's me, empty seat in the middle, and then some lady in her 30s sitting next to the window. But, like, you can go hours and hours and hours, never say a word, right? You know, just yeah. hand, hand her a cup where they're drinking it and pass back the empty pretzel bag, that whole routine. <laughs> Not say anything, right? The entire time, five hours and change, nobody says anything except people kept coming up to me for, in the plane. It's like, hey, <laughs> tap on the shoulder, shake hands, hey, I have a T-shirt, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> So finally, she asked me, we're like, wheels are, are you? <laughs> yeah, wheels are coming down. And she goes, hey, I'm wearing my Flat Earth Army shirt. And okay. she, she looks at me, she goes, look, I don't want to be forward or anything, but I got to know. People seem to know who you are. What is going on with that shirt? And I go, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm into the whole reverse psychology thing now. I go, you know what? <sighs> I don't really want to tell you. <laughs> <It's>, I, <laughs> 
I, I mean, you seem like a nice person. I look, if you like the life you're living right now, you think you got a good beat on things. Let's just leave it at that. You don't want to. You, you don't want to know about this. And she, you know, you know how that works on people. So they're no, 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 no. No, I want to know. I, wanna know. I go. Are you sure? Because if I tell you this, I don't want you coming back on me. You know, I'm treating it like the 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 flat Earth drug deal, right? In which right. it's like, you know, got got something for you. you no, know, I don't give this to just anyone. You know, don't don't take too much. Don't take too right. much. So finally, I lay it on her. You know, wheels are down. We're 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 just about to touch down, and I I I throw my 10 minute nickel tour at her, <laughs> and finally, you know, she's just swimming, right? You can just tell her she's just spinning. And and I go I go okay and she goes tell me more she goes what what else? you know do you have a card something like that okay here's what I'll do <laughs> and she's like scrambling for a piece of paper and a pen I just write on I go flat Earth clues right I just all I do is I write I don't even write my name and I go I go here's what you do you go home you look up that stuff you know you you, you eventually you find my name and told her my name I go a couple weeks from now when you call me and you <laughs> will. <laughs> <laughs> remind me that you were sitting next to me on the plane from Raleigh and then at least I'll have some sort of reference point. She right. goes, yeah, you think that'll happen? I go, yeah, yeah. I remember, it's Flat Earth University. I go, you'll lose sleep, you'll, you'll lose friends, but you'll gain some understanding. So enroll now, right? And, you know, smile, we'll glint off the teeth. And that was <laughs> it. We walk out the plane and as we're leaving, I could have sworn, you know, like like one of the girls was sitting back behind me. She's going, yeah. She's like pointing at the girl that laid next to her. She's going, I think I got her. I go, oh, I totally got this one. I wasn't even whispering. <laughs> this one here, she's she's done. In a couple of weeks, she's gonna be she's gonna be one of the one of the staff members, definitely. And yeah, and that's and so yeah, literally from the time I left all the way until I got on my plane or got off the plane and got on my shuttle, it was literally flat Earth the entire time. So it was a great it was a great end to the trip. So there you go. Yeah. Do you, do you find that people are recognized? Do you get out a lot or are you, Oh, I mean, other than the meetup groups, um, I mean, just... not that much. Well, no, because <laughs> I'll give Patricia Steer some credit here. Uh, if she hadn't put me on video, you know, I've done like 50, 60 shows with her. Yeah. A lot of people don't know. In fact, there was a woman I was, I was at a meetup with in Seattle and D marble was hosting it. And he brings me up because Mark's to take a few words. Right. And I've been talking to this woman for like 10 minutes. And I get up there and I say, hi, uh, you know, say a few, few things. And I come back and she's just staring at me. I go, what? She goes, you're Mark Sargent. I go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I am. I look, I get a little sticker on my thing. It says Mark. She goes, yeah, <laughs> but not Mark Sargent. So, no, a lot of people only know me for my voice, oh. and, which is fine. I, I don't mind. You know, that, that's, that's perfectly cool. Yeah. Um, but I did have that weird moment where I was at an airport in Atlanta and I was wearing my I am Mark Sargent shirt. <laughs> and the guy who was checking bags, he looks at me, he was checking secondary bags and he looks at me and looks at the shirt, looks at me, looks at the shirt and he walks in and, he, and, and he's a young kid, 20 something black. And he goes, he goes, you Mark Sargent for real? And I go, <laughs> yeah, why? And he winks at me and he does, the, he does the fight club thing. He goes, that's my name too. And he gives me the bag and sends me on my way. It was the most <laughs> surreal thing I ever dealt with. I was going, holy smoke. So most, yeah, to answer your question, most people don't know who I am, but when they finally figure out who I am, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, a cool it, thing, I guess. It, it is weird. Yeah, I mean, from except that people now, because of you are, are saying that they can blame me. Right. Like, right. People now. It, it was like, Who's this Mark Sargent that got Rob all screwed up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's your fault. That's the new tagline. It's, it's all your fault. Hey, man, another great show. Thanks so much for coming on tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And thank you guys for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. We'll see you back next week, 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. Good night, everybody.